Well, good morning, Fairhaven. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming this Palm Sunday. Would you guys all stand and sing with us and praise the King of Kings? of year and that's just the culmination of all of our faith when we think about the resurrection of our Savior and so for the past several weeks we've been learning a new song that was written specifically for this 
coming Easter weekend. It's a song that references the rising from the dead of Jesus Christ and the power that that gives us in our lives through the forgiveness of our sins because of his sacrifice for us. We're gonna sing that one more time today so that we all have a chance to get it down. And then next week, we're gonna let that go with a roar and we're gonna sing and celebrate in grand fashion. I'm really looking forward to it. So let's sing that today. So church, as we think about the Sunday before Easter, we're observing Palm Sunday, which is when Jesus made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And the people seeing him riding on a donkey spread their cloaks on the ground and shouted what? Hosanna. And so they were recognizing 
Jesus is a king, but they were expecting a king that was going to free them from Rome and create an earthly kingdom. And Jesus was actually creating a heavenly kingdom that we are now a part of. But the great thing is that he is coming again. And as he's coming again, we now know that we're preparing for a kingdom where he will rule and reign and then we can join him in heaven forever. And so as we worship, I would just urge us to examine our hearts and think, are we really worshiping that king? Are we letting all these earthly distractions going? Are we recognizing him for the heavenly king that he is? Are we preparing ourselves to meet our savior face to face, recognizing that we are worshiping along with angels who are surrounding him in his throne room even now? So to help us remember that as we worship today, let's read out of 2 Corinthians together. Reading with me, church. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. How I long to breathe the air of heaven, where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets, to look upon the one who bled to save me.
Heavenly Father, I pray that even now as we think in our hearts, seeing just a glimpse of heavenly beings surrounding your throne and crying day and night, holy, holy, holy. Lord, I pray that we would see your holiness for what it is, that we would see the majesty of who you are. Lord, even in our fallen state, even as sinners, you love us and you make us clean. And Lord, there is no one beyond your reach. And so Lord, I just thank you for your mercy and your grace towards us. We thank you for this upcoming week and what it represents. We thank you for the reality of who we are in you. Lord, I pray that we would never cease to be graceful, grateful for that. So we thank you for the blood of Jesus. Lord, we humbly thank you for the pain and agony endured on that cross on our behalf. So Lord, in love today, we come before you in worship. We fall at your feet. We join the angels in saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray today, amen. You may be seated, church. Well, good morning, Fairhaven. We are so glad to be worshiping with you today. I wanna to say a special hello to all of our friends who are online. Whether you find yourself in this room or you're worshiping online, we want to know you're here and we want to connect with you. And the easiest way to do that is texting the word hello to 32,000. If you're new with us, we ask our church family to do this every week. And you're probably wondering why. We want to be able to connect with you in real time. We also wanna be able to pray alongside you so you can submit prayer requests that way. You can also find out ways to take your next right step. The Fairhaven app is also a great tool to stay connected. In fact, this week on the Fairhaven app, we have special videos all about Holy Week. Holy Week is an important time in history. And we are also able to learn so many things about Jesus in scripture during that week. Starting tomorrow, through Saturday, we have hand-selected scriptures that go along with Holy Week and also have curated videos with our campus pastors just for you on the app. If you've never used the app for our daily devotions and videos, let me tell you, it is really simple. All you have to do is open your Fairhaven app and at the bottom you click the word daily. There it's gonna take you through three steps. The first is reading scripture. The second is you praying alongside other people who have submitted prayer requests. And we also give you a chance to submit a prayer request so your church family can pray for you. And then lastly, on the part that says reflect on God's word, that is where these videos are from our campus pastors that highlight all the things for Holy Week and all the ways that we can draw closer to God. It truly is a very simple task, and I encourage you to do this every day through the week because you may already have a devotional pattern that you go through, but this would just be one more step for you to find other ways to draw closer to God and prepare your heart for Easter. Last Sunday, our lead pastor, David Smith, challenged us to think of two people in our life that need to find hope in Jesus, and then us inviting them to Easter here at Fairhaven. If you thought of those two names, great. In fact, I thought of my two. If you haven't thought of the two people you would like to invite, take some time to do that, do that today. But once you think of those names, get your phone out and text the word invite to 32,000. You're probably asking why another text in? Well, because if you send us those names, not only will our staff and pastors pray for those people you send in, but we're gonna pray for you as the person inviting someone to church. We're in turn gonna send you a digital invite for you to text your friends to have them come to Easter services. And then we're also gonna send you tips on how to invite people to church. We are really excited about Easter, but you have to know, Easter can't happen if we don't realize what happened on the cross. And our Monday, Thursday services give us a chance to stop and reflect of the sacrifice Christ paid for us on the cross. was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. Looking back at the mistakes and the sin that have been in my life, Jesus sacrificed himself and put him up on the cross even though I should have been up there and not him. It's our 
sin, it's our shame that put him up there. And the weight of the guilt, the shame of how we still choose to sin, even though he loved us so much that he had to die for us. He was willing to show us the love he had for us, to look past the excruciating pain of his death on the cross into what eternity could look like, an eternity of love spent with our Creator. Our Monday Thursday services will be held here at our Centerville campus. They will also be streamed live online. We do know that our 6 p.m. service is full, but there are still hundreds of seats available for the 8 p.m. service. Those tickets are available for you on our app and website, and they are completely free. Today, our lead pastor, David Smith, is gonna return. He's gonna conclude our sermon series, Words from the Cross. So get your Bibles out, your sermon notes ready, and let's prepare our heart to learn together. Good morning, Fairhaven Church. <clears throat> Great to see you. If you haven't met, my name is David. I'm one of the pastors uh, here on staff. I want to say hello to Springboro and Northmont and Beaver Creek Classics and all of you that are right here in center of the campus here. It's great to have you here. Uh, thank you for being here. We are, in fact, concluding a series called Words from the Cross because we thought, what would it be like if we took uh, a whole seven weeks before Easter and actually looked at the seven words or phrases, statements, if you will, that Jesus made while he was on the cross? So often we read them quickly uh, in the course of a week, like Passion Week, and we're going to be looking at them again on Thursday night, our Monday, Thursday uh, service. But the truth is, if you spend some time looking at it and seeing the significance, I hope you've already noticed that none of this was unintentional. I mean, every statement that Jesus made was so very intentional, and it connected the Old Testament, and it connected Scripture, and we're going to see that again here today, and so I'm very, very excited to finish off the series with you, and if you missed any one of them and you want to go back, certainly this week would be a great week to do that uh, as we enter into Passion Week. It is Palm Sunday. Happy Palm Sunday to all of you. Palm Sunday is a significant week because it begins for us an eight-day journey uh, to the empty tomb, but there's a lot that happens to get there. And hopefully you'll spend some extra time because, church, if you will let me, let me just challenge you. Our faith calls for extra time this week because this week is really uh, the foundation of our entire faith. If there was no cross, if there was no empty tomb, we are just fools uh, singing some songs. And, uh, and we are not that. And so if you're here as a guest, we believe that Jesus died on the cross for us and that he walked away from the tomb three days uh, later. And so we're going to celebrate that in a huge, huge way. And so hopefully you'll join us uh, as we do that this week. I just want to say thank you also to those of you who typed in the word invite and sent us names. We had over 900 names from people from all the campuses. And so we're actually going to be praying over those names this weekend, uh, or this week rather. Uh, tomorrow the staff is going to start. And so as we think about those in our community, community and your family, friends, co-workers, and neighbors uh, who need the Easter message, uh, who need to understand the relationship that God offers to us, um, thank you for doing that. We really, really appreciate that. One of the things that I have uh, really been grateful for in my life is that I've had an opportunity to influence four sons and two grandsons now, and it's really, really fun. I mean, if you're a parent, uh, you, you know what I know, and that is, man, they grow up fast. Uh, these little boys are not little boys anymore. They're adults. They're men. Uh, they're as big as I am. These guys are awesome. Here's Tyler, our oldest. He lives in Florida. Brandon here, he lives in town here. Peyton uh, here lives in town, and Brent uh, is married and lives in Indianapolis, and we just love uh, the connections that we have with them. We talk to them every single week. If you're a parent, you know what I know, and that is some 
you want to talk to your kids, and it's amazing that they want to talk to you um, as adults, and so it's crazy. And they never stop being your kids. Am I right, parents? They never stop being your kids. And then we got these grandkids. We got Owen, um, which, you know, we talk to every single day. And then little Tuck, we call him Tucker, but his name is Tucker. And so we call him Tuck. And he's the, uh, you know, he's, he loves this right here. And so I don't know where he got that. The Texas Longhorn, we're trying to get him to be at Ohio State. But I don't know. He loves his little two little fingers there. It's cute as a button. It's unbelievable. But, you know, with these boys, uh, sons and then now grandsons, my wife, uh, for decades, uh, sung a song to each one of them, and is now doing it with our grandkids. It's the same song she sings every single night. We call it a Smith lullaby. I don't sing it. Um, I'm there sometimes. I, I listen to it, and I'm going to try it out with you today, all right? Um, I'm not going to sing it. I know some of you would be disappointed, but I try to get her to sing it, and uh, she, wouldn't, uh, she wouldn't participate. That's my wife, Kathy. Um, so I'm going to try it with you today, okay? Here is the Smith lullaby. Here are the words for, uh, and she sings it literally almost every single night uh, to all of our sons and now to our grandsons, usually when we're with the grandsons, but sometimes over the phone, sometimes through FaceTime. Um, it's, it's really, really fun. And the song goes something like this. I love you, Owen, and I sing this song to help you sleep the whole night long. This song of love that I sing to you, may it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ears. I am not going to sing it for you. I just read it for you. <laughs> that lullaby Kathy has been singing for decades and decades and decades. What's really interesting is that today, as we continue on in this series, we're going to read the last phrase, statements, words from the cross. And I bet you didn't know this, but what Jesus says on the cross is actually a Jewish lullaby. Every Jewish parent would have known. And so we're going to take a look at that. If you want, you have a Bible with me. You can turn with me to Luke chapter 23. I want to take a look at it with you. I'll tell you where it's found in Scripture beyond Luke 23. Luke 23 tells us uh, where the statement is and how Jesus made that statement, and we'll look at it. And here's the statement that we're going to reflect on today as we finish out this series. And the statement is this, that while Jesus was on the cross, the very, very, very last words he said were that we know of, Father, into your hands... I commit my spirit. You probably have heard these words before. Father, into your hands. No better place to be than in the hands of God. Am I right? Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. The very last words. We're going to read about it in just a second in Luke chapter 23. But let me go back a little bit and show you that the categories of all these statements, like, like I said, none of this is unintentional. Jesus was very intentional. He was quoting scripture several times. Today is no different. He was quoting scripture. He was making statements that everybody there or most everybody there knew what he was saying. And he was trying to communicate several different things. And as we've studied this, you can actually put them into three different categories. Let me give you those categories. Because all seven of these statements fall into one of three categories. Here's category number one, that he's having conversations with his father. Jesus is having conversations. As a matter of fact, there are prayers, and it happens in the beginning, it happens in the middle, it happens at the end. Let me show you. The first prayer that he prays, Father, forgive them. Because Jesus was connecting with the Father and wanted, wanted God the Father to forgive these thieves, and really, through these thieves, to forgive us, all of us who are thieves and criminals in many ways. And so, Father, forgive them. And then in the very middle of his six hours on the cross, he prays, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I told you last week, if you missed it, I believe that is the exact moment, the exact moment that Jesus realized the power of all of that sin on top of him and dying for us and took the whole load of the world's sin so if you're here today in any one of our campuses or online with us in the Dayton area or around the world somewhere, uh, we would be happy to tell you today that God offers a relationship for you, to you. He offers it to you because he took the penalty for that, and that's why he said this. And then at the very end, which is what we're going to look at today, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And because of this category here, it's no wonder that the Apostle Paul in Thessalonians says this. He says that you should pray always or rejoice always. That you should pray without ceasing, 
That you should give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God. You want to know what God's will is for you? Well, this might be a good starting place. You rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and that you give thanks um, all the time. I mean, what a great week to go into the Passion Week, the Holy Week, and to think about this category that Jesus uh, gives to us through these words, phrases from the cross that we get to communicate with God Almighty. That's amazing that he listens uh, to little old me, little old you, uh, and yet it's so powerful. Second category of the statements is that as you, there's proclamations that Jesus has as the Son of God. Proclamations that go something like this. Um, Today, you'll be with me in paradise. That the way that you and I get into a relationship with God is through Jesus Christ. You with me so far, church? We okay with that? That's the way that we get into a relationship with God. It's through Jesus. He did what needed to be done in order that we might have that relationship. And then he says, women, behold their son, behold thy mother, which simply means, as we talked several weeks ago, that Jesus is passing on responsibility. That's why we're asking you to submit names that we can pray about because chances are God has put them in your life in some way and you bear, I bear responsibility for the people around us. Uh, that's how God designed it. He wants us to take responsibility for people around us. Um, and so that's, that's why he said that. And then he said, it's finished. And uh, what a great statement that is, that Jesus finished everything that needed to be done. So that's category number two, which is no surprise then that Jesus himself in Luke said this, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. It's no wonder that Jesus said that. I come to seek. And so one of the reasons why we're praying, because God is already seeking them. Um, and he came to seek and to save the lost, the ones that are ruined. The word lost in the original language means ruined, destroyed, death sentence. That's what that word means. So can you imagine the people hearing that when Jesus said that? Like, wow, I feel ruined in my life. I feel kind of destroyed. I feel like, wow, I may have a death sentence in my life. And so Jesus says, I came to save you. I came to save you. I came to help you. I came to do all of that I did for, for that very purpose. And so that's category number two. And then category number three is that he expresses his humanity. How many of you know that Jesus is fully God and fully man? 100%, 100%. It's not 50-50. It's 100-100. And so Jesus is fully God. There's nothing that he gave up in his divinity. And he's fully man. He's in skin. Um, he has blood. He has nerves. He has, you know, eyes. And he has all the things that you and I have as human beings. And so it's no wonder that he said, I thirst. Which is really, really awesome because the writer of Hebrews tells us that based on his humanity, God can understand everything that you're going through. Because God experienced it through Jesus Christ. The writer of Hebrews says, For we do not have a high priest, Jesus now being our high priest, who was unable to sympathize with our weaknesses or with our struggles or with the things that we have in our life, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, and yet, what is it, church? Without sin. So he was perfect. So I could re literally uh, take you on a journey through Scripture, and it would look something like this. Um, Jesus knew temptation, Mark chapter uh, 1. He knew poverty in Matthew. He knew frustration in John 2. He knew exhaustion, disappointment. Jesus knew rejection. His own disciples rejected him. Jesus knew uh, sorrow. He knew what it meant to be ridiculed by somebody or mocked or made fun of in some way. He knew what loneliness is, and there's many, many more. See, church, if I could boil down all seven of these statements, and I'd like to do that for you today because as we enter into Holy Week, all seven of these statements really center around an idea for you and I in our own spiritual life, and that's this, that a richer and more meaningful relationship with God comes when you tell him what he already knows. Do you think God was surprised, God the Father was surprised by anything that Jesus said on the cross? No. Do you think God is surprised at all by the things that you're thinking, the things that you're feeling, the struggles that you have? Do you think he's surprised by that? No. I want you to know that as we enter into Holy Week, this is a perfect week for you to perhaps give it all to him. I mean, let him know. Let him have it, if you will. I mean, share your emotions and your thoughts and the things that you desire. Set some goals. This is the week for us to think about resolutions. 
Not because the calendar turns, but it's in Holy Week because a meaningful relationship will happen when you tell God what he already knows. Some of you are like, well, then why do I bother telling him? Because it helps us in our relationship with him and it becomes more meaningful when he knows that you're thinking about the very things that he already knows in life. And so what a great thing that would be as we enter into this Holy Week. Your Bibles are open, hopefully, and let's take a look at the last one, Luke chapter 23, drop down to verse 44, and I'm going to start reading it for you. As Jesus came in on Palm Sunday, Monday, he came in and he turned over the tables. Tuesday, he told stories. We have the Olivet Discourse. Wednesday, there were miracles that happened, things that took place. Thursday, he had dinner with his disciples. The Last Supper, we're going to have communion on Monday, Thursday. And then Friday, he died. Saturday is a day of waiting silence. So if you're waiting on something, this is your week. This is your week because we all are waiting. And then Sunday he walked away from the tomb. What a great thing that is. Luke chapter 23 verse 44. It says this. It was about the sixth hour. That means noon. And there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. How many of you know there's a lot of people coming into the Dayton area for this eclipse? Did you know that? I mean, it's amazing, actually. I don't exactly know when it is, but from what best guess for me, it's somewhere around 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I've got staff that have taken the day off <laughs> because they want to see the eclipse. Um, and I'm thinking, it's two minutes. Take your lunch break. I mean, <laughs> you know. Um, so there you have it. Darkness over the whole land for three hours till 3 p.m. or the ninth hour when the sun's light failed. I love that statement. Can you imagine if the sun's light failed for more than two minutes? That's amazing. The sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. We'll look at that in a second. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly. I mean, absolutely. This man was innocent. And all the crowds that assembled for this spectacle, that's an interesting word, spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, they returned home beating their breasts. What does that mean? We'll talk about that. And all of his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Let's take a look at Jesus' statement for a minute and come across a couple things that we might want to think through. First of all, as Jesus is making the statement, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. He's actually quoting Psalm 31. You may want to look at Psalm 31 this week. It was a Psalm of David. There's so much in there. Um, I, I wish we had time. I would read the entire Psalm, 25, 26 verses, I think, somewhere around there. Um, but it is such a good read. It has so much in there. Jesus quotes Psalm 31, verse 5. Luke tells us that he spoke out in a loud voice. The word loud there means megas. And we know what that might mean? like a megaphone. I mean, it was really loud, which is really interesting because he's been on the cross for six hours. He's gasping for breath. I've already told you that a crucifixion is a death of suffocation. And he's there, and the last breath that he has, he says it out loud, which I want you to stop and think about it for just a minute because in this statement, we have both, again, Jesus' divinity, he's the Son of God, and his humanity. I have had the privilege to stand and to sit and to hold many, many people's hands as they slip into eternity. I've seen it over and over again. There's a phenomenon, and if you talk to anybody who's in the medical field, they'll tell you better about this uh, than what I could do, but there's a phenomenon called the terminal lucidity, which means that at the very end, their last breath they get a surge of energy, a surge of, of a statement that they want to make. Uh, sometimes the very last thing that they say, uh, it, it happens almost like a surge. Their eyes become bright sometimes. It doesn't happen to everybody. According to research, it's about four out of every ten. And I believe in his humanity, this is what happened. There was a terminal lucidity that Jesus came alive in that moment in his 
physical body, and he spoke loudly. Why? Because he wanted everybody to hear. Because he's going to quote Psalm 30, 31, uh, verse 5, which is in fact a lullaby. We'll get to that in a second. He wanted everybody to hear, particularly those that were there that were from the Jewish background, Jewish ethnic background. And he's there in a loud voice after six hours. He says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Amazing. We don't know how many people were there. We can only surmise. Uh, but he shouted loud enough that sure, certainly people around heard it because it was a mega voice. Secondly, as we look at this statement, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, I want you to notice that Jesus is quoting, as I mentioned to you, Psalm 31. He's quoting the word of God, and he is, in fact, the word. In other words, Jesus dies with the word of God on his mind. That's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing that Jesus, who is the word, according to John, right? John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God so Jesus is the word and he's dying with the word of God on his lips Psalm 31 verse 5 I commit my spirit into your hands and thirdly as we look at the statement I mentioned it to you it was a Jewish lullaby um, before falling asleep sleep parents Jewish parents as they heard this uh, Jewish families as they heard this they they were like oh wow I mean, this is what you would say to your children in a prayer, a bedtime prayer. Chances are they sang it because the Psalms were really songs that they sang. And so in Psalm 31, this is one of the statements that they would sing, Psalm 31, verse 5, where they would say to their, their children as their children are going to bed, not unlike my wife when trying to get the boys to sleep and trying to get the grandsons to sleep, they're laying down, the lights are off, and you sing this lullaby, Father, God, into your hands, I commit my spirit. A bedtime prayer. Every Jewish person that was there would have understood that. They would have known exactly what Jesus was saying because he's literally quoting what is for them a sense of knowing the word of God and a lullaby that was there. They taught their children so if you were a child and you were now an adult, you knew that. And so you taught your children because you were taught as a child. If you're a grandparent, you would sing this song. You would say these words, this lullaby, if you will. Every Jewish leader not only recognized it as a lullaby, every Jewish leader would have understood that Psalm 31 is a psalm of David who's asking for the help and the assistance of God the Father. Of course, that's what Jesus was doing. He was asking for the assistance of God the Father. Absolutely amazing moment as he says those words. It reminds me of the many, many evenings that I have listened and heard Kathy sing it as she sung to the boys and they would fall asleep knowing that we loved them, knowing that we wanted them to sleep well, knowing that we cared enough to be there with them, knowing that we knew that you know, today is what we have. We don't know about tomorrow, but we're grateful for today. The lullaby really is a way of expressing gratitude for the day, that we were able to be with you, we were able to influence you, we were able to love you. What a gift it is uh, to us. It's absolutely amazing. I want you to imagine with me a couple things. I want you to imagine in this moment some things that we get from the writer Mark, we get from the writer Matthew. Uh, the first thing we read here is, is you go back to verse 45 uh, in Luke 23. First thing we see is that the curtain of the temple was torn in two. I want you to imagine this moment. Jesus is hanging on the cross. It's pitch black. It's dark. The sun has failed. They're standing there, and Jesus makes the statement. We don't know if the curtain was torn the very moment he said this, or the moment before he said this, or the moment after he said this. How many of you know it doesn't matter? The curtain in the temple was torn in two. Now, if you don't know what the temple is, the temple was in, the, in Jerusalem. I've been there, actually, and many of you here at Fairhaven have traveled there from different campuses. Uh, if you go to Jerusalem, the temple's up high, and the temple is huge because everybody went there for worship. Um, and as you were there, you would go into the courtyards there. They had courtyards for Gentiles, courtyards for Jews. And then you'd go to the holy place, um, which took another level of, of holiness, meaning that we would bring offerings in and, and sacrifices in. And, and then there was the holy of holies that 
was the inner part of the holy place. And the holy of holies, the high priest only went in once a year. And he would go through the curtain and into the Holy of Holies. Now, when you think about this, this curtain is 60 feet high. That's six stories. It's 60 feet wide. Massive. And in fact, historians tell us that the curtain was so tall and so wide and so heavy that the thickness of it was about the size of a man's hand. So I got a big hand, but let's just say it's about like, can you imagine a curtain that thick, six stories high, 60 feet wide? And Matthew tells us that it tore in two. Mark tells us it tore from the top to the bottom. You think there's any symbolism there? It isn't that man gets to God. It's that God came to man. That God is the one that opened up the pathway. God is the one that makes us available for us. God has done all the work. He wants a relationship with you so bad that he's willing to die for all the wrong in your life and in mine. And the curtain was torn in two. Not only that, listen to this. Matthew tells us that an earthquake happened. How many of you by raised hand have ever been in an earthquake? Can I just see your hands? All of our campuses, Springboro, Northmont, Beaver Creek, Classics. Yeah, I'm looking around here. Okay, not many of you. Um, living in Asia, in Indonesia, when I was a kid, um, I can remember at least seven times, uh, and it's probably more, but I can remember earthquakes. And if you've ever seen an earthquake on TV for the news or whatever, I mean, everything is shaking. Everything is shaking. There's nothing that's not shaking. And so you feel a complete sense of insecurity, and you're like, oh my goodness, everything is shaking. Matthew tells us there was an earthquake. It's pitch black. Jesus is on the cross, and he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And the curtain tears, earthquakes going on. Not only that, Matthew tells us that the rocks were splitting. Can you imagine like popcorn rocks going boom, shattering everywhere? Shrapnel of rock hitting you in the shin as you're walking around town. Amazing. Can you imagine this moment? Certainly. God is there, and he wants to get all of our attention. Isn't that what the Passion Week is? That God wants, to give, God wants us to give him our attention during this Holy Week. And I don't know about you, but I, I think he deserves it. Anybody else? Amen. He deserves it. And so what would it be like for us to enter in these next eight days and to give God our attention and let's center ourselves around this statement because I'm going to suggest three questions that we ask as we conclude here today. I want you to imagine. Secondly, I want you to imagine that Jesus died. Messiahs don't die. I want you to imagine the disciples were thinking, wow, I, we thought this thing was going to be a big deal. We thought he was going to come into Jerusalem, Palm Sunday, and take over. Rome's going to get destroyed. I mean, wow, Jesus died. And didn't he have to? Because you see, Jesus' death for you and for me signifies that he ransoms us back, that he paid the ransom to buy us back. Think about that for a minute. He paid that back. He forgives us of our sins. He accomplished what his mission was. It's no wonder he said, it is finished. And then, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. It's amazing. It's amazing that Jesus died for you and for me. I mean, we've heard that. We know it. Many of us, you grew up in church, and you've heard it a million times. But I, I want us to think about that for a second, that God himself died for you. That's amazing. Let's not lose that as we go through this week. Thirdly, I, I want you to notice with me and imagine the moment. Uh, pick it up with me in verse 47. Something else happened, pitch black, earthquake, rocks shooting everywhere, curtain torn in half, Jesus makes a statement, and it says there that when the centurion saw what had taken place, and we don't know if he was anywhere near the temple to see that, but he certainly felt the earthquake. He most likely saw a rock splitting. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God. His life was changed in a moment, in a moment. And he cried out saying, certainly this man was innocent. 
And all the crowds, so that was more than one person, had assembled for this spectacle. I mean, I guess it's kind of in some ways, if you don't care about it, it is a spectacle. Earthquake, rock shattering, curtain tearing, darkness, kind of a spectacle. Um, And so for them, it was a spectacle, and they saw what had taken place, and they returned home beating their breast, meaning they returned home, and they were mourning. They were mourning probably because they were scared. I mean, it was dark. All things were happening here, and, and, uh, but they didn't, they didn't praise God. They didn't believe. I want you to notice that at, imagine the moment there was a man who saw and believed, and there were many who saw and just left. Do you realize that next weekend... There are going to be billions and billions of people who will gather around an empty tomb. Billions. And in our little town here in the Dayton area with all of our campuses, um, we're hoping that thousands will come and experience what you and I already know if you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus. But here's what I know. There are some that are going to come and they're going to see and they're going to believe And there's others they're going to see, and it'll be a spectacle, and they'll leave. That's why we need to pray, and we need to ask God to really seek them out and to do something big, big in their life, because what an incredible moment that was taking place here. This wasn't just a statement that Jesus made. He made a statement quoting Scripture with everybody knowing what that was, with in total darkness, with earthquake going on, rocks flying everywhere, the curtain tearing in half, and a centurion standing there goes, it's true, it's true. But a bunch of people left. There's a couple of lessons for us, I think, from this statement that Jesus makes, into your hands, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. A couple of lessons for us that I want to just uh, focus on with you. Lesson number one for us today is this, that daily we must commit our lives into his hands. Now, this is probably something that you've already heard before. You've probably heard somebody tell you that you need to, it's a daily walk with God and, and that you need to do things daily in your life. And so I may not be telling you something that you don't already know. Let's zoom in on it just a little bit. Because you see, you only surrender your life once. When you surrender your life to God, you say, I recognize this broken relationship, and I recognize that you are the only one that did something about it, and so I surrender my life to you. I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want to be a son or a daughter of the king. Wow. So we surrender once, but we commit every single day. So we commit the decisions that you have to make, You commit the project that you're working on at work. You commit your marriage to God. You commit your kids to God. You commit your grandkids to God. You commit your single friends to God. You commit the fact that you you might want to be buying a new car. You commit the fact that you're wondering about a career. You commit the fact that you're thinking through things in your life. You commit to the fact that you may be making decisions and changes in your life. You commit all of it. Let's be reminded this week that as we walk into Holy Week that we commit every single day about every single thing in our life because God cares because a meaningful relationship will come when we tell God what he already knows. It's amazing. That's the first lesson that we learn in this moment. Second lesson is our most valuable treasure is our soul. When Jesus says, into your hands I commit my spirit, Jesus is using a word that describes both the Holy Spirit and the soul of a person. Not surprising, because he's fully God and fully man. He used the word pneuma. And so Jesus is saying, I commit to you, and I give to you the most valuable thing I have, my soul, and I give to you and give up my life for the fact of what you want to do through me for all of humanity. The most valuable thing you have is your soul. And I wonder if times we get that out of, out of balance. If we get things in our life that feel a little bit more valuable. And Holy Week is a perfect time for us to think about that. Because I think one of the lessons we learn from this last statement is that the most valuable thing that you and I have is our soul. That we can give and commit. That we can surrender, if that's what you need to do today, or you can commit 
all the things in your life, the small, the big things, we commit them to him. Thirdly, I want you to see that the third lesson we can learn is that desperation is never a time for entitlement. You think about it. Jesus is on the cross. He could have in the moment said, God, I I don't deserve this. I've done enough. Um, Come on. Um, Look, I'm I'm your son. Uh, Let's be done with this. Let's, you know, let's do this. Come on, help me out here. We don't see any of that. We say, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. You know what's interesting is that if we're honest, when you find yourself in a desperate situation, it is very easy to try to be entitled in our spiritual life. God, don't you see I'm coming to worship? Don't you see that I'm joining a small group? Don't you see that I've served? Don't you see that I've helped? Don't you see that I'm giving? God, don't you see? I mean, do you know who I am, God? I mean, have you not seen what I've been trying to do here? I've been trying to follow you, trying to be obedient. It's very easy. Desperation is never a time for entitlement, but a time for mercy and grace. What a great thing to remember as we walk into Holy Week. Because some of you might be at a point in your life where it's even hard to think about Holy Week because you're desperate. You're desperate for an answer. You're desperate for healing. You're desperate for uh, for God to provide. You're desperate for something in your life. Desperation is never a time for you and for me to cry out entitlement. So here's what we're going to do together. We're going to journey to the cross and then to the empty tomb. Eight days as we journey to the cross and then to an empty tomb. That's a pretty good week. Hard week, but a good week. And we get to journey and see both of those in our lives, the week. Let me give you questions to ask yourself perhaps and then we'll be done. And the question might be, what do you need to commit today? Because there might be something specific that you need to commit as we go into Holy Week Lord, into your hands, I want to commit whatever that might be for you. You you just today, throughout this week, throughout this entire, you know, eight days, this will be a good question to ask yourself. What do you need to commit today as you're thinking about your relationship with God? Second question, is there a treasure that's more valuable in your life? Because it is easy to allow things to become more valuable uh, in life. Is there something that's more valuable And should we just offer that to him to say, Lord, I know this is valuable to me, and so I surrender to you because I know that my life in your life and the relationship is more valuable. Maybe that's something that you ought to think about uh, in the course of this week. And third question is, are you in desperation? Because if you are, cry out for grace and mercy because he hears us and he loves us. And I bet that he'll might, he might even sing a, a lullaby over you. He might even sing a song. If I read my Bible correct, it says that sometimes God sings a song over us because he loves you just that much and he wants to influence you and love you. Tell him what he already knows. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you, Lord, that as we are walking in Palm Sunday into Easter weekend. We thank you, Lord, that there's so much that took place in those eight days. And we've tried over these seven weeks to look at these statements that you made intentionally because you're trying to teach us something, because you care about us, because you, Lord, you want this relationship to be so meaningful and to be honest and truthful. I pray, Lord, for all of my friends here in all of our campuses and online, Lord, for the fact that some of us here today, we need to, we need to celebrate by committing something to you, Father. We need, to, we need to commit to you. We need to let it go. We need to offer it to you. We, we can't do this on our own. Father, some of us have gotten things mixed up in our lives and a relationship with you is maybe not the most valuable thing right now and we need to fix that. So we want to articulate to you, God, we love you more than anything. And we thank you for your love for us. And Lord, for some of us, we are in desperation. I pray, Lord, that you would provide healing and you'd provide grace and you'd provide answers and you'd provide peace and and joy and courage as we enter in. Father, we recognize that our faith calls for greater attention as we go into this next week. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, amen. 
Thank you for joining us for service as we are one week closer to Easter. But before we get there, just like we mentioned in service today, we have Maundy Thursday here at the Centerville campus on Thursday at 6 and at 8. All of the tickets for 6 are gone. Um, if you want to attend here in person, those would be for the 8 o'clock service. But anybody can attend at any time, no ticket required, online with me. I'm excited to, for that service specifically so that we can reflect on who Jesus is and why his sacrifice means something in our lives. So that when we come to Easter, it's that much more sweet and we can celebrate his resurrection together. I'm really excited about these Holy Week devotionals and I would love to walk with you through them. Just text Sermon to 32,000 and I would love to share my thoughts on what I'm reflecting. I'd love to hear what you're reflecting as well. If you have a prayer request or you just want to praise God for what he's doing in your life, I would love to pray with you in this time. Just text me at 937-800-46. Zero five, and we'll see you next week for Easter.